I am a professor in the Information Systems Department as well, and I've been here at BYU since 1995. Um, here's my outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit of background about me. Then I'll talk about what e-business is. A pretty simple definition of e-business. And then we'll talk, we'll spend the majority of our time talking about three foundational principles. If you understand these principles, you'll be in a good position to understand what it is that other lecturers will have to say to you. They're going to be talking in the context of e-business. They're going to expect that you'll understand this foundational material. And so this can be pretty helpful as you get a feel for the vocabulary and some of the concepts that, that they'll be speaking about. And then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the future and how we as individuals need to deal with a tech-focused future. So a little bit about me. So I grew up as the second out of 11 children. And that means I had a lot of younger brothers and sisters. And those of you who have younger brothers and sisters, you understand that when you tell them, hey, go do this, they'll very often do exactly the opposite thing. Um, well, I had a very unique experience in this context of having younger brothers and sisters who were very independent creatures. Back in 1975, 1979, when I was about 14 years old, my father brought home a box. It was a Heathkit computer, and it was full of a bunch of parts. And we started pulling the parts out, and we soldered them together, and we built this computer. Here's a picture of the insides of one of these computers. This isn't the one that we built. This is a picture off the internet. But anyway, you get the idea. We actually, it wasn't one big integrated circuit that you could just plug into a circuit board and then you had your computer ready to go. We had little tiny transistors and resistors and other little pieces that we had to plug in and solder in. And, and we had some bugs to work out. But when we got this thing built, I then, at age 14, had to figure out, well, what do I do with this thing? And I started to play with it. And I started to realize, oh, this thing obeys my every wish. It does exactly what I tell it to do. It does no more and no less, just exactly what I tell it to do. And so I had this experience of, boy, I feel powerful in this world of computers. And it was a very eye-opening experience for me. And it changed the course of my life. I have been a, uh, oh, what would you call me, a propeller head, perhaps? A nerd, yeah, sometimes. Uh, a geek, yes. You know uh, Kip in, in uh, that movie, Napoleon. Napoleon Dynamite, that's the one. Kip is singing to LaFonda at the end of the movie. They're getting married, and he's talking about how he loves her. But he still loves technology. Now, I'll refrain from trying to sing it for you. But I'm one of those guys who still loves technology in spite of all the other things that are available. Um, hopefully, I'm not quite as nerdy as Kip, but... That's a debate, I suppose. I did my bachelor's degree and PhD in computer science, and uh, I've done a lot of software development. In fact, um, I was in the middle of a coding frenzy just before this lecture. I was working on a project, a research project of mine, and, and doing a little bit of coding. Um, I'm on the information systems faculty, as I mentioned. I teach some of the more technical topics, and um, I spent some time last year on sabbatical being CTO for a local startup firm called Entice Labs. What an eye-opening experience that was. Um, I felt like I was doing a master's degree in OB as opposed to being a CTO. I guess that's what a CTO is. Uh, I kind of knew that, but I didn't really know it. And so it was, it was a very good education. I love technology, though. And uh, I spent some time almost a decade ago now working on a book with a couple of colleagues in the accounting department. Principles and Strategies for Accountants in the Field of E-Business. And as we worked on this book, we came up with a... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we recognized that our students were facing a different world than we grew up in. You'll probably hear this as a, as a common theme throughout my talk today. But back in my day, things were really different. Uh, now, it wasn't three feet of snow uphill both ways to school. Um, but, uh, yeah, w we, had, we had a different world than you have today. We did not have cell phones. Okay, how many of you have a cell phone right now with you? Okay, raise your hand if you don't. I can't see. Is there anybody? Uh, okay, one. I don't have my cell phone with me, but that's because it's sitting in my office. I don't want to be bothered in the middle of my lecture. How many of you are online right now on the Internet? Okay, that's a, maybe 25% that are willing to admit it. 
we have the ability to be connected everywhere. Our world is increasingly becoming networked and digitized. And we want you to understand, you as students, to understand the, the forces that are operating in this world. And we want you to be leaders in that world. And uh, so that's, that's why Kevin Rollins donated to, uh, to BYU and helped establish an e-business center that I've been heavily involved in that sponsored this textbook that, uh, that we put together. And uh, as we were putting this textbook together, here's the definition that my colleagues and I came up with for what e-business is. Now, you might think of e-business as, hey, I'm going to go to Amazon.com and I'm going to buy something on the web. Well, that's a form of e-business. I would call that e-commerce. Uh, but e-business is broader than e-commerce. E-business is the use of electronic networks and information technology to exchange business information and execute transactions. You're doing stuff with networks and technology that add value to your company. That is e-business. It could be sending an email. It could be downloading something off the web. It could be any of a number of different transactions. It doesn't have to be buying and selling stuff online although that certainly is a form of e-business. So it's much broader. And there are some principles that underlie e-business. Three that I'd like to talk about. So the first one that we call Moore's Law talks about how technology grows in power exponentially. The second one is Metcalfe's Law, where we have a network effect that drives standards. And the third one are the principles of disruptive innovation that uh, I'll spend some time on. So let's start with the first one. OK, Moore's Law. Back in 1965, the year I was born, um, Gordon Moore, who was co-founder of Intel, he observed what was happening in the microprocessor industry. And he said, look, it seems like about every 24 months or so, we're going to double the number of transistors that we can fit on an integrated circuit chip. So um, here's, a, here's a graph from Wikipedia, a site that we all know and love. Uh, and, and this is a linear log linear scale. So you see that the left hand, the vertical margin is going uh, up in uh, uh, powers of 10. So you have 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, et cetera. And this, this line that you see as a linear line is actually exponential in nature. So uh, it's doubling every 24 months on that dashed line. And these little dots that you see, these little dots are the Intel processors. And so it's, it's impossible for you to read them from where you are unless you're online and looking at the Wikipedia chart with me right now. But that first little dot in the lower left-hand corner, that's the Intel 4004. And then we go to the 8080 and 8088 and other processors up into the uh, currently what processors you probably have in your computers today. Moore's law has been about right. Now, it's not really a law. You remember Pirates of the Caribbean where they talk about the rules? They're not really rules. They're really more like guidelines. Um, and we have kind of the same dynamic here. This isn't, there's no physical law that says we're going to double transistors every 24 months. But it's, it's this notion that's out there that the engineers say, oh, we've got to double the number. We've got to increase to a certain level. And it has happened to go about that, about that speed. Um, so. Here's what happens when you double. Uh, in, in generation number one, we see one unit. And then we see two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16. And, and it just grows in this exponential curve. Here's a little story to maybe help you appreciate it. The emperor of China, it is said, met the inventor of the game of chess. And he was taken with this game. He just loved it. He thought it was a wonderful creation. And he wanted to give the creator of this game of chess something wonderful. And so he said, ask whatever you'd like. And if I can, I'll give it to you. And so uh, the inventor of the game of chess, he thought about it. He said, hmm, I'd like a grain of rice. And now the emperor of China is sitting here thinking to himself, what, a grain of rice? I'm, I'm offering you whatever you want, and you're asking for a grain of rice? And uh, he says, one grain of rice for the first square, two grains of rice for the second square, four grains of rice for the third square, and so on until we cover the board. So the emperor of China thought for a moment, and he said, OK, granted. And he had his people go start gathering rice. How much rice did they need? There are 64 squares on a chessboard, 8 times 8. And so it's going to be 2 to the 64th power, roughly. It's actually minus 1, exactly. 2 to the 64th minus 1. But anyway, uh, it's about 4 billion times 4 billion. 
Now, if you study a little bit of history and you do a little bit of uh, number crunching, you'll discover that that's more rice than probably has ever been grown in the world. And there's no way that the emperor of China could deliver that much rice. What it illustrates, though, is the power of doubling. We have these generations, um, and exponential growth goes very quickly. If it's money, that's a great thing for you. Um, okay, here's a little graphical illustration to help you visualize this. So what if we start doubling our transistors? And uh, we go from one generation where we've got this number of transistors, and this is actually two doublings. But anyway, um, what happens as the number of transistors doubles? What, what changes do you see in there? Okay, the transistors get smaller. What else? Okay, they increase in number. We fit more in there. One more thing. There are more lines. They Actually, they get closer together as well. And so because they're smaller and because they're closer together, we're able to run these things faster. And so in addition to the amount of, of, uh, of computational units that you have available to you, in addition to that increasing, you also have a faster processor. So that old Heathkit H89 that I put together with my dad at age 14. By the way, any guesses on how much that cost? Three grand, Three grand is about right. A little bit more. Three grand. And today, you buy a computer for a fraction of that that runs circles around that thing. OK, how fast do you think it was? So, so rather than playing a guessing game, 2.56 megahertz where today we're now talking about three and four gigahertz processors being the latest and greatest thing. And in our processors today, running at that speed, you have multiple parallel computational units working at the same time. So really quite a dramatic increase in capability over the generations. Here's another way to look at it. Let's think about, OK, back when I was in high school, if you had a 1200 baud modem, you were cool. That was. That was 1,200 bits or ones or zeros. 1,200 zeros or ones you could transmit every second. Now, how fast is your connection today to the internet? It's probably down here in this range where you see the DSL cable modem Wi-Fi, somewhere in, in this neighborhood. So if you were to transmit the entire New Encyclopedia Britannica over the internet, back in my day in high school, it would have taken you a month to do that. And now you can do it in a matter of minutes or even seconds. It's, it's mind-boggling, the, the amount of power. And there are technologies out there where you could transmit that stuff almost instantaneously in a fraction of a second. And this doesn't even list the very latest stuff that's on the drawing boards today. So it's not just happening in our processors. It's also happening in other technologies. We have these converging trends. We've got increasing computational power. So our microprocessors are running faster, and they, they can do more stuff. We have increasing storage capability. How many of you, by show of hands, have a one terabyte hard drive or bigger? OK, that's pretty good, almost a half a dozen. I went out last summer, and I bought a one terabyte hard drive because I could. You know, I'd been waiting for the day, as, as a good geek would, would do. And finally, I went into Costco one day, and there it was for just a few hundred dollars. And I thought, well, today's the day. I'm going to have my terabyte. How many of you have at least one gigabyte of storage with you on some sort of a device right now? OK, that's almost all of the class. OK, the first hard drive that I had access to was something like a 5 or a 10 megabyte hard drive. And that was really expensive. And it was a business that was able to afford it. Um, OK, so enough of back in my day. Um, so our, our storage cap capability is going up. Our bandwidth is going up. How many of you have fiber to your home so that you can do 100 megabit connections? Ah, the blessed few. It's about 10% of the class, it looks like. I've got DSL. I've had cable modem in the past as well. That's probably what the majority of us have. But the day that I saw Google Earth, I thought, ah, I understand why I want fiber in my home. Because I want Google Earth to go real fast. I'd actually like it on my cell phone, but it's not quite fast enough for that yet. Um, OK, so all of this is happening. These increases are happening at a decreasing cost per unit. And so what that means is that not only do you have a much more powerful computer than my dad and I soldered together back in 1979, but you pay a lot less for it. 
where my dad had to pay $3,000, you can go get something much more capable for a few hundred dollars. And you have increasing connectivity. Now, we saw by the raise of hands earlier how many people have access to the internet right now. I hope that you don't take advantage of that during sacrament meeting or other times when probably connectivity is, is not so desirable. But the, the truth of the matter is you can be driving down I-15 at 75 miles an hour um, out by Scipio somewhere in the middle of nowhere practically and you can be connected around the world to anybody. And that is the power of Moore's Law. Okay, so, so what is this drive? In the, in the business world. We increase our speed and capacity and we lower our cost. And what this does for us is it lets us process information faster. And as we do that, we start to rethink our operating procedures. We innovate. We say, look, uh, I've got new tools at my disposal. I can do this much better than my competitor or much better than I had been doing it. I can be better at this. And we develop new goods and services. So what are some of the new goods and services that you participate in regularly? How many of you use Hulu to watch television shows? Okay, so I had to actually go buy a TiVo so that I could record the shows. <laughs> here's, a, here's a little bit of an anecdote for you. I went and bought my wife our first TiVo on Valentine's Day. I said, honey, you're really going to love this. And uh, she was kind of grumpy. She thought it was a Homer gift. You know how Homer would give Marge a bowling ball that said Homer on it, and it was drilled for his fingers, but it was her birthday, so she got the bowling ball. Um, but now she loves it. But anyway, nowadays you don't even have to do that. You can go to Hulu or some of these other services, and they've got the shows queued up and ready for you to watch on demand. And it's amazing what's happening there. Uh, iTunes. There was never any thought of iTunes when I was a kid. We had to buy... Okay, I came after 8-track tapes, so we, we had to buy discs. And, and cassette tapes, and then CDs and, and uh, so forth. Now you just, you just go to the website and you download it. New goods and services showing up all the time. Um, I'll talk about the network effect in a minute, but the network effect increases the demand for more IT as we develop these new goods and services. And then that leads us to increase our investment in research and development, which lets us increase our speed and capacity and lower the cost. And we've been in the cycle for decades now. And it's a virtuous cycle, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure, although there are some drawbacks that we'll talk about later, but um, this is happening very rapidly. And just the same way that technology has been changing rapidly for so many years, now businesses are doing the same thing. Business models are evolving. And it's not good enough just to say, well, I'm going to go upgrade my tech. You have to upgrade your procedures. We can patent business processes now. It's really amazing what's happening there. So cycles are shorter. How many of you have written a handwritten letter or card or something like that and sent it through the snail mail in the last few months? Anybody? Oh, that's more hands than in the previous section. Oh, good for you. Um, but that's still less than 25% of you have done that. We're losing the art of mailing something, uh, putting a stamp on the envelope and sending it off. Um, distances between people are getting shorter and much smaller. For me to communicate to China or to Austria, it's just as easy to do that as it is to communicate across the street. How many of you have used Skype? Yeah, okay. Skype, I can call when I'm on an international trip, I can call home for pennies a minute. It's really amazing. The first time I tried it, I put 10 bucks in the account, and it was more than a year before I drained that 10 bucks. And I did a lot of talking on Skype. Now, there are still some barriers. We, we do, we're awake at different hours, and we sometimes speak different languages, and there are cultural differences and so forth. But it's, it's a fact that the web never sleeps. It's always on. And you have a global audience for your website. Now, so Moore's Law. We have exponential growth in our technology. More formally, you could simply summarize it with our number of transistors doubles every 24 months. But that captures just the the fact. Now you need to understand what does that fact do. So if on the final exam you've got a question dealing with Moore's Law, okay, understand it's doubling transistors every two years, but the implication really is exponential growth in, our, in the power of our technology. Second principle is network effect. A network effect occurs when a product becomes more valuable as more people use it. 
Here are four examples. Telephone network, World Wide Web, Microsoft Windows, English language. The telephone network is maybe the, the typical example that we give. Does one phone do me any good? If there were exactly one phone in the world and I owned it, would that do me any good? Only in the sense of maybe Dr. Seuss's star-bellied sneeches who could walk around being just a little bit better than the sneeches without stars on their bellies. Um, if you got one phone, yeah, you could say, well, I've got a phone and that makes me cool. But um, you can't do anything with it. Uh, when you get a second phone in the network, now you've got one other person you can talk to. A third person buys in, and you can now talk to two people. And each of the other two people can talk to two people. A fourth person buys in. Now you can talk to three people, and they can each talk to three people. So you have this, this growth in the value of the network as more people come on to the network. And uh, so Metcalfe's law states that the value of a network increases in proportion to the square of the number of users. OK, let's think about that for a second. As more people join the network, our value increases without us having to do anything else at all. Um, this happens because, well, for a number of reasons. But, but one of the things you need to understand is that the initial cost of building this network is large. But the incremental cost to add one more user is small. OK, so let's talk about iProvo. Some of you guys are on the iProvo network. How much money do you suppose they spent Digging trenches, laying fiber, hooking them onto utility poles, running that service down all the different streets in the city of Provo. Do you think it was $1,000, $10,000, $100,000? Do you think they had to spend millions or maybe tens of millions? Probably somewhere in there. OK, building the network is expensive. How many fiber networks exist in Provo? You've got iProvo. And now Utopia is going to some of the other cities, and I can't wait till it comes to my neighborhood in North Orem. Uh, I'll be one of the guys who signs up when it, when it does. But building that network costs a lot of money. Adding one more user just costs a little tiny bit. You have somebody who goes and runs a line from the main network to your house, and that's it. Really minimal cost. OK, let's think about it in terms of Microsoft Windows. Building the network, in their case, wasn't laying lines in the ground. What they did is they had to pay software engineers. The software engineers wrote code. And it took a lot of years. How many of you are Windows users? Probably all of you have had to use Windows in one form or another. Um, what version number did you start with? OK, some MS-DOS users, but that's prior to Windows. That's not Windows. So what's the first Windows you used? 3.1 and 95 is what I'm hearing. OK, so I actually saw Windows back in the, I, I saw a 1.0 briefly, but then I saw a 2.0 and was able to play with it on my own computer. And I looked at it and I thought, man, what a joke that is. That's, that's silly. I would never use Windows, at least Windows 2.0. 3.0 came out and I thought, well, this is better, but still, I love my amber screen. Oh, but it's so easy on the eyes. And, I've uh, got great, you know, WordPerfect and other great pieces of software. Um, Windows 3.1 came out, and then they got networking associated with it. And then Windows 95 came out, and then 98 and, and XP. Do you think Windows is pretty good by now? <laughs> I'm hearing a combination of yeses and noes. Uh, so how many of you use something other than Windows on your desktop? Less than 10% of the class is not on Windows as their primary desktop operating system. Okay, that's remarkable success. The reason it happened is because a network effect induces a winner-take-all situation. And here's what happened with Windows. Users like to buy Windows because lots of developers write software for Windows. Developers like to write software for Windows because there are a lot of users who buy it. Now, which is the chicken and which is the egg and which one comes first? In the case of Windows, Bill Gates he never had the best technology. He never has in the whole history of Microsoft. What he's always had is the best business plan. And he's been able to capitalize on that best business plan. He's been scrappy. And, and he's done some great things for the technology world, much as we love to hate him. 
uh, he's still a good guy, even though he's a geek, maybe even a nerd. Um, but anyway, uh, I digress. Um, Windows. So, so he treated developers really well back in the day. He wanted developers to have great compilers, great tools to be able to build software. And he built a little core of developers who loved Microsoft. And then as they built software, he was able to go to the users and say, hey guys, this is the wave of the future. We've got a graphical interface. And we've got these developers who are writing software, and you're not going to find that on these other competitive operating systems that uh, aren't, th we're going to leave them in the dust. And in fact, he did leave them in the dust. Um, so very quickly, though, we had this feedback cycle that said, oh, we've got a good developer community, so we'll attract more users. We've got a good user base, so we're going to attract more developers. And he had effectively a monopoly in a very short period of time. And that's what happens when you have a network effect. When you have this condition where it costs a lot of money to build the thing in the first place, but it costs very little to add one more person to that product, to that network, then you'll get a, a network effect. And because users tend to move in a herd, um, they move very quickly to a common standard. So back in the day, we, we may have said something to the effect of, well, you never got fired for buying IBM. Now, what do you guys think of IBM? Is that a great company, a, a powerhouse in technology today? When I say tech powerhouse, what companies do you think of? Google. That would be the first one, probably. We all use Google almost every day, if not almost every hour. Apple. Any other tech powerhouses? Intel. Intel. You know them for their Intel Inside campaign. OK, I'm a little surprised nobody said Microsoft. Are they a powerhouse? Yeah, you're, you're kind of hedging your bets a little bit on that one. Um, back in the day, IBM was king of computing. They were undisputed. And that changes over time as we have these different network effects. And that leads me into this, into this next topic, which is principles of disruptive innovation. So Clayton Christensen, who happens to be LDS and a professor at Harvard, um, did his work in this area of disruptive innovation or disruptive technology, as it's known. These disruptive innovations tend to displace entrenched technologies, not because they perform better, but because they give a better value. Now, how many of you would rather drive a Lexus than a Hyundai? OK, but you wouldn't rather pay for a Lexus than a Hyundai, would you? So there are some of you who are going to drive a Hyundai because as a college student, maybe you can say, you know what? I look at that, and I can buy a new Hyundai. And I can't buy a Lexus, maybe. Um, or I could buy an old beater um, that may not be quite as reliable. And you're going to make this decision. You know what? That Hyundai offers a pretty good value proposition. may not be the sexiest brand out there, but it's going to be reliable, and it's going to do the job. OK, what happens with disruptive innovations is you alter the formula that people use for judging things. Here's a typical technology uh, trajectory. So the, the market is going to demand a certain level of performance over time. And there will be a low end and a high end. So let's take cars. Let's keep with cars for a minute here. At the low end, you might have your Hyundais and your other, other uh, brands uh, boy, I, I can think of some famous ones in, in my day. But um, there will be a low end and a high end. And over time, the market is going to demand more. Back in Henry Ford's day, probably nobody thought of power locks and power windows. Uh, maybe they didn't even think of windows. But um, nowadays, you expect to have probably power locks and power windows and other nice things on your car. The market becomes more sophisticated over time as we teach people what is possible. So you get, a, you get a technology trajectory that crosses what the market is demanding here. Over time, you develop a technology. And maybe it starts out to be a low-end tech. And then over time, you add features and more and more features. And soon, you're at the point where, hey, this is really a nice product. Now, uh, let's take Word, for example. Word is a great example. Microsoft built a great word processor. How did they displace WordPerfect? Wasn't WordPerfect the king of word processing on the PC? How many of you use WordPerfect today? I saw one hand. 
I have WordPerfect actually installed on my Office machine because there are some files that I need to, to deal with. That it's better to have WordPerfect there. Um, Word actually started off on the Apple platform. It was a Macintosh application. I first became acquainted with it when my dad was using it at his work, and uh, I, I became aware of it. And then all of a sudden, here it is displacing WordPerfect on the PC because WordPerfect didn't shift from DOS to Windows soon enough. What happens is you have a disruptive innovation, and you have a new technology that starts to develop. And as this new technology grows, eventually it crosses into what the market is demanding. When it's first created, you look at that and you say, ah, that's silly. I would never buy that. That's a dumb technology. But over time, it comes to where, you know what? There is a segment of the market that is interested in it. And where is the sustaining technology when that disruptive innovation is ready for the low end? Where is it? Do you suppose that's expensive stuff up there? How much does Microsoft Word cost compared to WordPerfect? Or what does a Lexus cost compared to a Hyundai? Do you really need a car that can park itself? I mean, that's kind of cool to talk about, but do you really need that? It's hard for me to say, I mean, you can imagine a, a more extreme situation where perhaps that Lexus that can self-park really is a useful thing and really is, you ought to buy it. But um, that's, that's way up here beyond what the vast majority of the market really needs. And um, so, so uh, disruptive versus sustaining technologies. H here are a few more examples. Um, courier service. What did that disrupt? Okay, to some extent, the postal service has been disrupted by courier service. Email, what did that disrupt? To some extent, the postal service. There are things that uh, um, you just don't even think about sending through the mail that when I was a kid, we sent through the mail because that was how you got it here and there. Um, let's see here. What did the, the railroad disrupt? Stagecoach, perhaps, and other shipping technologies. Okay, um, over time, we've had a lot of disruptive technologies, and they continue to be introduced on a regular basis. Maybe you are thinking of some disruptive innovations right now. How about cheaper foreign labor? There's a disruption for you. Are you scared of cheaper foreign labor? Are you scared of outsourcing? Now, personally, I don't worry too much about that one because I think that as we outsource certain jobs, we'll leave the more creative things here uh, for us to work on. So maybe more mundane stuff that's easier to manage and uh, gets outsourced. So I don't worry too much about that, but there are a lot of people who are upset with cheaper foreign labor and outsourcing. In all cases, it tends to be that the dominant companies are slow to make the transition. Clayton Christensen studied manufacturers of various things like disk drives. And it turns out that at every new generation of disk drive technology, he saw a new manufacturer taking charge there. What happens is that your, your disruptive products are cheaper and simpler. You get less profit. And um, the other thing, at the same time, those disruptive technologies get commercialized in markets that, that you're not even paying attention to because they're not important yet. You cannot make your numbers. You can't make your quotas serving that other market. You've got to pay attention to your main market. Your most profitable, profitable customers want improvements on your existing product. They're not going to tell you how to build this other adjacent technology in this market that you don't even care about. And so you're not paying attention to it uh, as, a, as a regular manager. Um, resources come from your customers who you're listening to and your investors. And they're going to talk to you about how to improve your existing stuff. Large companies don't grow by uh, paying attention to small markets. They just don't. And, and uh, if the market doesn't exist yet, it's really tough to analyze and say, well, here are our numbers on this market. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why traditional management does not see disruptive innovation. And even the very best managers stumble in the face of these things. One of the best examples that I can think of of a company that dealt with this properly was Charles Schwab, a brokerage that became one of the first to be really big in the online brokerage market. They set up a division within their company. And they said, 
okay, we want you, we see that the, there's something happening with the web here. And somehow, we're going to have to transition to an online model. We're going to make you be the company that eats our traditional business. You're, you're going to cannibalize us. And they gave them autonomy. And, and they were able to build within their own company the disruptive innovation that then gradually took over their traditional market. Why are you going to pay 60 bucks to go talk to a broker when you can go to a website and just get that information almost for free? That was the dynamic they were facing. And they were probably the most successful of the brokerage firms to make that transition because they took this other approach to dealing with it. OK, so the three principles, three foundational principles. Moore's Law, which is exponential growth of your technology. Second one, what was it? Network, Network effect or Metcalf's Law, named after Bob Metcalf, the creator of uh, the inventor of Ethernet. And that, what that one tells you is that if you can establish the right conditions where it's expensive to initially develop your product or your network, but inexpensive to add more users, and you can do this right, if you really focus your initial effort, you can take over the market. The users will move as a herd, it tends. And so uh, you want to create network effects that work in your favor. And the third principle? Yeah, principles of disruptive innovation. And so you want to understand this dynamic that there are technologies that will be created in a separate adjacent space. Over time, they'll get better. And eventually, they can take over from the entrenched technology because they offer better value. I want to give one more illustration before I go into the final segment here. How many of you would be interested in a five inch, black and white, solar powered television? Would you buy that? OK. Somebody's shaking her head back there saying, no, I want my 42-inch high-def television in color. And maybe I want 60 inches. I don't know. But anyway, um, you, you're, you're a more sophisticated market. But I'll bet if we went to Mongolia or someplace where the power grid isn't so good, where they have plenty of sun, and where there is a television signal, um, I'll bet they'd be a little bit more interested in having that 5-inch solar-powered television. Or another one is, I don't know if you've heard of the, the initiatives to get cheap laptops into the hands of third world countries. But uh, Nicholas Negroponte, for example, over at MIT, has been working on one laptop per child. The $200 notebook um, that he'd like to really sell for $100 instead. But um, you would not be satisfied. Some of these things, uh, you have to crank it, or you have to pedal on it, or do something like that to generate power for this laptop. Um, it is not a laptop that you could put next to, your, to the one that's in front of you right now, and you'd say, oh, that's a good, that's a good trade off. I'll go with the one laptop per child hardware. You wouldn't do it. But over time, there will be technologies that spin off from that effort. In fact, the CTO of that initiative, she left to form her own company in the arena of display technologies. Because they've solved some problems in displays. And you know how important displays are. You have them on your cell phones. You have them on your watches. You have them on your laptops. You have them on your iPods. You have them all over the place. And some of the technology developed to help serve this third world problem of we have lots of children around the world who don't have access to all this computer technology. Some of that technology is going to enter the mainstream market and benefit you. OK, um, so three foundational principles. Now, uh, Thomas Friedman wrote a great book called The World is Flat. And in this book, he talked about three phases of globalization. Back from Columbus to the 1800s, we saw industrial powers. Countries that had might and could produce, they were the ones that uh, were the first global powers, You know, the, the colonizers, England and Spain and, and Portugal and so on. Then, from about 1800 to 2000, he, he characterizes this as globalization 2.0. Here we have multinational companies that are exerting their influence worldwide. And then now, from uh, 2000 to the present, he says, individuals are empowered. We now have what's effectively a flat world. I can talk to somebody in Afghanistan. And in fact, if you go to overstock.com, um, 
you'll find products that have been created by craftsmen and craftswomen in third world countries. Maybe you want that rug from, uh, from India or Pakistan. Maybe you want that article that was created in Afghanistan. And Overstock will connect you to that artisan. They make a lot more money than they would just by selling to regular distributors, import-export folks. And Overstock makes a little bit of money for, for connecting us to them. But individuals are being empowered in a way today that we had never thought of just a few years ago. Now, how are you going to deal with this world where, where things have changed so much and continue to change so rapidly? I am a firm believer that those of us who are technology gurus cannot just sit back and be technology gurus. It's not enough to say this is cool technology. It's all about value proposition now. You need to understand what the competitive drivers are in the businesses that you're working with. Um, you need to understand the strategic aspects of your business. And you need to figure out how am I going to solve those business problems with this technology. We are awash in a sea of technology. How do we use it to do stuff that matters? What is the value proposition? And you're going to have to retool over and over again. How many of you have a page on Facebook? How many of you have written a Facebook app? I see a couple of hands. OK, those in the tech space are going to see that the platforms change. Almost all of you, or at least more than half of you, are on Facebook or some other social networking site. Now, how do you leverage that? That's an interesting question. The fact that you can be contacted anywhere, do you sometimes feel like you have a leash, a technological leash, because you're connected everywhere? Um, you're going to need to learn how to reduce and simplify. OK, there was an interesting report. Uh, I've got the link in the presentation that will be posted on our website here. And, and, uh, or you can just Google 60 Minutes Millennials. Um, it turns out that uh, you guys are the millennials. And back when I was a kid, you could actually think about growing up and working for one company your entire life. I'll bet very few of you think in those terms anymore. Um, as Marley Safer interviewed employers and people in this new generation, the millennials, uh, he observed some really interesting trends. M millennials don't get, they don't make the company their life the way they make their friends and their family their life. Um, they don't care about the company as much as they care about their own life. And um, one of the things that happens, there's an opportunity for you. Employers are finding it so hard to please some of these new employees that people who are willing to have a little bit more of the traditional values uh, have a real opportunity to stand out amongst their peers who are placing these really interesting demands on employers. I don't have the time to go into all the examples, but there is a fun little uh, report to go, to go view either the, uh, the video story or to read through it. Uh, it opened my eyes as to how the, how the market is changing for new employees. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, too. The same way that we're awash in technology, we are awash in knowledge. And I'm, I'm reminded of uh, something that I read in Isaiah about the earth being covered with the knowledge of the Lord, the way that uh, the waters cover the seas. We literally can find almost any information on the web. I am so much smarter because I've got access to Google and Wikipedia and all these other sources of information. And I can be sitting in a meeting and somebody can be talking about something I've never heard of before. And I Google it. And up comes a web page. And I scan through it. And I can instantly say, oh, well, yeah, I, I know about that product. It costs you $3.99. And here's where you go buy it. Um, we have to continue to learn. There's no other strategy that's going to work. We have to continue to learn our whole life long. Um, but technology is this two-edged sword. You can do a lot of things with it. And some of those aren't so very productive. Um, you might spend too much time aimlessly surfing. Um, you might be sort of attention deficit in the way you live your life, the way you attend your class. Maybe you think, uh, well, it's going to be much more interesting to do my email instead of listen to the professor. And that might be true, actually. It puts more pressure on us to be more interesting and, and more entertaining to some extent. 
But you've got access to, uh, uh, you could waste your time, you could be involved in things like pornography. There are things that, there are problems that technology brings. It could just be the fact that you've constantly got this leash to the web or to all of your network of friends and, um, and coworkers. But technology also solves a lot of problems at the same time. You can do wonderful things. You can communicate your message more effectively. Every one of you can publish to the world today exactly what you want to tell them. And uh, so while there is a long list of problems that shows up with technology, we solve a lot of problems with technology at the same time. I hope that having this background of these three foundational principles and thinking about how e-business is changing your world today, I hope that you'll, you'll set some goals for yourself and think about it and uh, that this will lay a groundwork for, the, for some of the discussions that you'll have in this lecture series throughout this semester. Thank you for your attention. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions.